Our speaker today is Dr. Maya Garcia de Muñori, researcher at, at Donostia International Physics Center and Iker Basque, the Basque Foundation for Science. Uh, Maya did her PhD at the University of the Basque Country, and afterwards she, she held postdoctoral fellowships at the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory at the USA, and also the Max Planck Institute of Microstructural Physics in Germany. Uh, in 2017, she won the L'Oreal UNESCO Prize for Women in Science. And Maya is an expert in the study of electronic and magnetic properties of topological materials and topological phases. And uh, her research has been recently published in Nature in 2017 and 2019. And today she will talk about recent, recent developments in the study of topological materials. So, please, Maya, come on. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Maya. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay. So uh, it's a pleasure to be here and an honor to give a colloquium in this uh, very uh, amazing institute. So uh, my research field is the study of uh, topological properties in complex matter physics. We look at the dynamics of the electron in, uh, in crystal and we try to um, predict the topological properties that actually will have an effect on possible applications. And what I'm going to uh, explain here today is how, uh, what is topology in condensed matter physics on one side, how do we understand it, um, and how we identify uh, materials with topological properties. Uh, in, particular, in particular, in uh, 2017, we developed uh, a methodology that was called topological quantum chemistry, and we used this methodology to actually classify all the crystalline phases that one can find uh, in nature and by using this uh, methodology we could identify uh, all the topological materials that were uh, supposed to exist in an experimental database and with this uh, classification we could uh, build what we call the periodic table of topological materials where by given a periodic table when we build up a, a compound we can actually um, figure out the <coughs> properties with a very easy method. Okay, since um, all this uh, summary would sound a bit abstract, I'm going to start uh, from scratch. So, symmetry and topology these days are the two main uh, cornerstones of research in condensed matter physics. Symmetry applies to local order parameters and topology is related with uh, non-local properties of materials or global properties of materials. Um, the classification of uh, materials in, in physics, it was given for many years by looking at the spontaneous symmetry gradient of different phases of matter. So, for example, uh, uh, we have a material, it uh, breaks a symmetry, and this symmetry uh, acquires an observable, and this observable can be measured. And there is no an adiabatic transition between one system and the other one. A simple example is given with uh, a ferromagnet, when we have a material with, a, with a magnetism with a not clear direction of the spin, the spin preserves the rotation symmetry. Whereas uh, when we have a ferromagnet, the, the, the spin of the electron becomes a particular direction, and this creates a magnetic moment, and magnet, magnet, this magnetic moment has an expectation value, and it can be measured. And these are uh, the local order parameters that actually distinguish between different phases of matter. What happened around 20 years ago? It happened that actually systems with the uh, same symmetries display different non-local properties. Um, and these non-local properties were very robust. And they persist under uh, different uh, external parameters. The reason why these properties were those robots is because they were related with a topological order. So topological order can actually describe uh, phases in matter that were, cannot be uh, predicted by spontaneous symmetry breaking. And some of these phases are the quantum hole effects, the topological insulators, spin liquids, and the handling chain. And they display um, fascinating, fascinating features, mainly related with transports or fractionalization of the conductance, such as quantized conductance, fractionalization of fractions and <coughs> particles, and so on and so forth. Okay. So, 
This was the introduction. So apparently, as I said, in condensed matter physics, we find fascinating features and uh, with many potential applications of transport properties related to topological objects. But we will start, as I said, I was going to start from scratch. Why topology? Why do we call it topology? So uh, topology is the branch of uh, mathematics that actually study the, the manifolds, the geometry of the manifolds and the relation between these manifolds and the smooth deformation. The first topological formula that I learned without actually uh, knowing it was a topological formula when I was in high school is the Euler's Fourier formula that gives you a relation between the vertices and the faces and the edges of a polyhedron. And this formula is always two no matter the dimension of the polyhedron. So, why? Because, why is a topological formula? Because it's related with the geometry and the way objects are connected. So topology is about geometry and connection of objects. If we go uh, beyond polyhedrons, uh, if we want to know the topology of, uh, of uh, objects with a curvature, we, we do the integral of the curvature to the surface and we use the gauss bonnet formula. This gauss bonnet formula is here, and the result maps the number of holes an object has with, uh, I mean, this integral maps the number of holes that an object with the number of holes an object has. And it's defined by uh, the number of holes which is given by this G here. This G is called genus, and it's what is called a topological invariance. So this is the classic example that probably many people have seen already. If you have a sphere and we do the gauss bonnet formula, g is equal to zero, whereas if you have a donut, g is equal to one. And these objects are not adiabatically connected because integer number cannot like, uh, connect adiabatically because uh, in order to go from a sphere to a donut, we actually need to pinch a hole and that's very far from adiabatic. So, you will have a map. A map is going to belong to the same topological phase as the donut because under a smooth deformation we can convert this map into a donut. So uh, the genus of a surface does not change under a smooth deformation, and actually, this uh, genus here can be generalized in the Euler polyhedron formula whenever we have a hole in the polyhedron. All right. So, what happened in condensed matter physics? In condensed matter physics, we also perform an integral, but it's not over the surface, but over the very curvature. And the very curvature is the dynamical phase that uh, an electron acquires after performing a closed loop. Our chair number, our genus, our hole, the topological invariant that I have introduced before, we call it chair number, and it's related to a microscopic uh, quantity, such as the quantity. So when uh, from Flitzing measured the whole conductivity in 1992, the reason why there was such a conductivity was because the, the topological invariant of the system was not, not zero. It was measuring a topological order. All right. So uh, this is what uh, it's for us, for the condensed matter physics, the meaning of topology. Now, what is a topological insulator? Because topological insulators are everywhere. So uh, roughly speaking, a topological insulator is a material that is actually insulating in the bulk but has uh, edge or surface states that are conducting. And it has uh, very exotic transport properties. What is the difference between a topological insulator and a trivial insulator? A trivial insulator is a material that has uh, an equal number of electrons as occupied states and the electrons are localized close to the atoms. So here we have our materials, the red dots are the atoms, and we have the electrons moving around the atoms. Whenever we apply a magnetic field, the electrons start moving around the atoms with a single frequency, and this is what we measure. What happened in a non-trivial insulator? Okay, so, but in non-trivial insulators, what we have is in the box, the behavior is the same as in a trivial one, but when we apply a strong magnetic field, the electrons start moving in the edges. And this uh, conductivity that actually uh, from Clinton measured in uh, 1982 and he won the Nobel Prize because of that is very robust. It's independent of the size, independent of temperature, and independent of weak disorder. And it is because it's defined by a topological order. 
<laughs> so if this is our, let's say, the, the energy uh, diagram of our insulator, we know that in an insulator will have a balance band and a conduction band and a uh, gap of forbidden energies. When we are dealing with a topological, I mean, with a uh, topological system, we have a conduction channel that, uh, channel that actually goes through the forbidden energy. And because there are no other channels, it's actually very interesting because there is no possible back scanning. So this has the quantum hole effect that I think uh, we already know. <coughs> the, the breakthrough in quantum matter physics happened when the quantum spin hole state was predicted. And the quantum spin hole state is a topological uh, phase that actually happens in the absence of magnetic field. The only need, the only ingredient, ingredient that is needed is a very strong spin or recoupling. So if we have a very strong spin or recoupling, what we measure is that on the end of our elevator, two channels, one for a spin up and another one for a spin down. Both of them, both of them happen in the forbidden gap of the energy, and there is not effective tra tra transfer, but there is effective spin transfer. Why is this so interesting? It's interesting because, as I said, the topological orders are very robust, independent of the size, independent of temperature. The back scattering is forbidden because um, the spin of the electron cannot flip because it happens in the middle of uh, the energy gap. There are no other states. Therefore, they are uh, unstoppable currents with very low dissipations. And actually, this could be very interesting for uh, many type of uh, electronic or in general technological applications. All right. Um, how do we define topology in condensed matter physics? To define topology in condensed matter physics, we have to go to 19, uh, 1929 when Felix Bloch uh, introduced the Bloch theorem. So here we have our crystal. So our crystal is uh, made by arrangement of atoms, and the atoms have orbitals, and it's it will have a number of Avogadro atoms in a piece of crystal, right? So we know that the electrons can be around the atoms, they can be here, they can be between the atoms, they hope. I mean, there's hoping between the electrons. So what physicists do to actually um, find the electronic properties of, of materials is the final Hamiltonian and the analyze it. If you want to diagonalize a Hamiltonian in real space, it's very difficult because our Hamiltonian, because of the hookings between the different wave functions, is going to have a of diagonal element and it's a huge matrix to diagonalize. So, what Felix Bloch realized is that if we Fourier transform our Hamiltonian to the reciprocal space, in the reciprocal space, we can define all the properties of our system in what is called the Brillouin zone that is formed for a little. Uh, a smaller amount of atoms, I mean, it can go up to 400 atoms, but in general, most of the materials have between 20 and 40 atoms in the unit cell, and our Hamiltonian in reciprocal space is diagonal, or block diagonal, but it's not as big as in real space. Uh, so, we solve the Schrodinger equation for our Hamiltonian in reciprocal space, and what we find is that our energies here are given, we we'll find different energy levels for our electrons, are, is given as a function of the momentum k, which is the corresponding, uh, let's say, variable of uh, r, the position vector in real space. So we find our energy spectrum as a function of k, and we have these energy levels. And if we look at these energy levels, we can somehow think about topology too. How are the, some bands are connected, some bands are not, some bands go here, and then they go back, they split. So there is some topology in the way the bands are connected between them as a function of this quantum number that we call uh, k. And of course, since we are in reciprocal space, we lose all the information about the position vector of real space, and we have k, which is more related with the speed of the electrons. Since this is if we look at transport properties, is the correct space to look at the properties of material. So we can, as Felix Bloch introduced, we can look at the properties of electrons in reciprocal space in the Brillouin zone. 
it happens that the brilliant zone, we can close it. If we are in one dimension, we can close the brilliant zone and create a manifold. If we are in two dimensions, we are going to have like a kx, ky, and we can close it and create a torus. And if we are in three dimensions, we have two torus. So, because we can create manifolds in reciprocal space, our wave functions in reciprocal space can be uh, mapping um, objects to actually describe topology in real space. So if we have in one dimension, we can map T1 to S1 in real space, and we are in two dimension, our torus can map the T2 into S2 or R2. So we can actually map the, the, the properties of the region zone into real numbers and define the topology of our system. And this is what we do. We look at reciprocal space looking for topological properties. Um, I introduced a formula before. As I said, we do the integral over the, the, the very curvature, and actually this is uh, the formula we, in principle, we use, the integral over the, the very connection, which is related with the very phase. And this UN and UN print here at the, <coughs> the wave function in reciprocal space. But um, this is actually um, a bit uh, tedious calculation when we are dealing with crystals and electrons. And I'm going to introduce what uh, the nominal paper of uh, uh, Fu, Gay, and Mele in 2007 and 2005 to calculate topological invariance in a more uh, easy way. So, in uh, the region zone, which is uh, depicted here, we have some symmetries, I mean, we have some points that actually <coughs> are the high symmetric, uh, the most high symmetric of the, of the cell. And by looking at the information of the high symmetric points, we can actually uh, derive many interesting properties of our material, and in fact, we can derive the topological properties of our material. In uh, 2D, we have maximum four high symmetry points. In 3D, we have eight. And uh, as I see here, whenever we have a topological phase, in 2D, we have edge states. And in 3D, what we find is surface states with a conic dispersion. The way to calculate the topological invariance is by looking at the high symmetry point of, of the band spectrum and uh, calculate the parity product with the symmetry that we, we want to uh, analyze in this particular case is time reversal symmetry. So the, the, we have this matrix, we calculate the parity product of the, at the high symmetry points of the elements, and if the parity <coughs> product is uh, odd, we have a topological insulator, and if it's zero, we have a trivial insulator. Um, in this case, I'm looking at time reversal symmetry because there are topological phases protected by time reversal symmetry that are called the C3 variant, but this is just an example. Of in the, in the following, I will give a, a full explanation of all the possible topological properties. But this is just an example. So what does this mean? What does this product that I uh, wrote here mean? It means that here we have the, the, band, the band spectrum of a material given by the energy as a function of uh, momentum k. If we have a strong spinner recoupling, what happens is that the energy levels are shifted and uh, one goes below, the other one goes up, and in the end, the result is that we have an inversion of the bands. When we have this inversion of the bands, we, have, we can have a topological insulator because we are, our bands somehow have been twisted, and this twisting has created the inversion of the eigenvalues. In topological insulator, there is uh, this, this thing that they, they are insulating with the valve that conduct energy, uh, conduct the um, electricity on the surface, it's called a uh, bulk binary correspondence. And uh, an easy way of understanding it is if we have a non-trivial insulator and we, <coughs> we interface it with a trivial insulator, which is for example vacuum, what happens is that our, let's say, inversion of the bands need to, the bands need to be uninverted because uh, this inversion only happens when we have a, a non-trivial system, when we have a trivial system, the, the bands recover their natural uh, order, let's say. So, in this, this natural order, what happens is at some point, the, uh, the gap closes, and in this, this point where they close, we have an edge point, we have a surface state. And in this gapless region, that actually, it's uh, very small, we have, um, 
will have conductivity. Um, the trivial insulators, they fulfill the atomic limit. It means that the electrons are close to the, to the atoms. And what happens in non-trivial insulators is that they do not fulfill the atomic limit because the electrons somehow are away of the atoms. And because they are, well, because they are away of the atoms, when we break the translation symmetry, these electrons then have to float. Another way of looking at it, when we look at the torus that I introduced before, is when we have a topological insulator, what the electrons do within the torus is a full loop. And this full loop makes the connection between the, uh, the balance bands and the conduction band. When we have a trivial insulator, what the electrons do is they do not make the full loop. At some point, they go back, and the band does not connect the balance bands and the conduction. All right, so um, we want to look for uh, topological insulators because we find that the topological insulators are very interesting because they have uh, edge states and the edge states are very interesting. Uh, regular insulators are boring because the bands below the full field atomic limit, the bands above the full field atomic limit, and therefore the electrons are localized close to the atoms and we don't have uh, connecting edge states. We also have metals in within the topological materials. When in within the material in the bulk, this coupless uh, situation happens between different sub uh, space of the material. And in this case, what we find is like a protected crossing. This is, for example, the case of graphene, and uh, usually it happens in the half filling. So topological materials are interesting versus uh, non-topological materials that are not interesting because even if we have a half filling, what happens in a non-topological materials is that under any external parameters, the band is B. So we have a half filling with one band below the Fermi level, another one above the Fermi level. All right. So um, any questions? Okay. There's, there's a question too. Yes. Mm. It seems that you always have a continuous mm, lines uh, in between the gap. And it, would it be possible to also have the isolated points between the? Yes. <coughs> that's advanced topology. <laughs> yes, you can have common states. I, 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 at some point, I will mention it. Yes, okay. you can have points. But the topology is weak. I mean, the strong topology always connects the balance bands with the conduction band, and this is why it's interesting because it always has to be in the middle of the gap, no matter what happens. I mean, you can you can have vacancies or you can apply an electric field, and still they will be in the middle of the gap. When you have a corner states, uh, if the crystal is ideal, they will be in the middle of the gap. But some external perturbation happens; they can be like. Uh, Brief down to the balance one, for example. But uh, I'll get there. Okay. All right. So uh, this is the histogram of the discovery of the political materials in the last, uh, let's say, almost 15 years. So um, there is always a symmetry protecting these faces which is the one that gives the inversion of the bands. In this case, it was time reversal symmetry, but it can be other symmetries. So the, the first prediction of a 2D topological insulator was done in 2016, and they predict uh, edge state in the two-dimensional mercury telluride protected by time reversal symmetry. The experiment was done in 2007, and it was proved to be actually, uh, it was measured, the, the whole uh, conductance. Later on, the 3D topological insulators, which is the version of 2D were predicted and also um, found experimentally with various techniques, we could see the, the surface state. And in the beginning, they were all protected by time reversal symmetry. It means that this, this edge state could not uh, disappear if we break that symmetry, and that can only happen with a magnetic field or magnetic atom. In 2011, for the first time, it was introduced a new symmetry protecting these faces, and it was mirror symmetry. And they were called mirror chain insulators. So we could have this edge state in uh, some particular surfaces uh, perpendicular to this mirror, and they were protected by this symmetry, which means that to break the, the, the conducting properties, one has to break the mirror symmetry. In uh, 2014 or 15, 
uh, the board found also that uh, not only uh, the political insulators could be um, could have a topological protection, but also uh, semi-metals and bi semi-metals and the x metals were introduced. And later on, uh, a bunch of new symmetries uh, they were proved to actually protect uh, topological phases. And finally, the higher order titans, as you mentioned before, were introduced where actually uh, you can have, um, let's say, uh, a full quantary correspondence in uh, dimensions. Uh, so, so far till uh, 2011, in 2D, we would have uh, 1D uh, topological edge. In 3D, we would have 2D topological edges. But higher order titans, actually, in 3D, you can have a 1D topological edge. It can be a charge just in the middle of the gap. And that was mainly the, the story of topological uh, phases in materials. So um, this is the formula we use to actually uh, calculate topological invariance, which is uh, rather complicated. And in 3D especially, we need to calculate in different surfaces and different directions. So uh, the, the questions that where it's still open for, for the community, it's like, okay, we have a topological phases in condensed matter physics, we have a very interesting surface and edge state, and sometimes they are protected by time reversal symmetry, sometimes by this crystalline symmetry, this other one, then there are higher order TIs, but what was a bit chaotic and random, and a full classification uh, was still a uh, mission. I mean, when are we going to know what are all the topological crystalline phases that one can find in nature? Or in another way, is when are we going to have a set of bands and when are we going <coughs> to predict that bands are topological. So we physicists, we always look at reciprocal space where we analyze our Hamiltonian, we look for a gap, and then we implement this formula that is actually uh, pretty much time consuming. So um, what if the way we were looking at topological phases was the wrong way? Why the way to look at topological phases was not by looking at reciprocal space, but we should look at real space. Like even an orbital and a contact in a material, just looking at real space, can we actually predict what are going to be the topological properties in reciprocal space? And the second question was like, um, despite being you know, one of the most feeling uh, fields in condensed matter physics, out of 200,000 materials in the ACSD database, only around 200 materials were reported. So are these materials so, so esoteric? Or we are not looking for them in, in, the, in the correct way. So what I'm going to explain now is a classification that captures all crystal symmetries and has a predictive power. If uh, we start uh, from scratch, and I'm going to look at symmetries in real space, we need to consider the space group, because materials are classified in the space group. And the space group is a symmetry, is a set of symmetries that describe our crystal structure in 3D, and it has the following ingredients. We have 230 space groups, and we have unit lattice translations, quorum group operation, non-symorphic orbitals, and atoms in some lattice positions. So with this information, how can we go from real space to electronic bands with actually solving a Hamiltonian? <laughs> or this is the information I get in a, a structure file in any experimental database. So I have the space group, which is given by a number. I have the composition of the material, the by composition, where the, the symmetry uh, set of positions are, and the, the internal atoms position related to, to these numbers here. But anyway, so with these three lines, Am I going to be able to actually predict whether these materials can hold to fluid phases? And the answer is yes. With this method, with actually just reading those lines, you can, by using a mathematical tool that was introduced uh, by SAC in 1982 that is called uh, elementary bar representation. So uh, now we're going to look, we're going to think as bands as a uh, representation. So, um, and a representation is a matrix. So what we're going to think is that, okay, I have a band, and this band has these symmetries, and what are the symmetries in real space going to tell me about the reciprocal space? So what uh, bands in real space tell me about reciprocal space is how bands are connected. 
because a band representation is a set of bands of reciprocal space that are linked to the same orbital. And they respect all these crystal symmetries and they reversal symmetry. And they can be uh, classified, well, um, divided in, in, three, in three types. So we can have elementary band representations that are the smallest set of bands that are connected in reciprocal space, physical elementary band representation that also respect band reversal symmetry, and a complicated band representation. So, um, what we're going to look is at the elementary band representations. And in order that you have a more visual idea of what I'm talking about, each color in this band structure tell us, describes an elementary band representation. So the green one is one elementary band representation, the yellow one is another one, the blue one is another one, and the red one is another one. And because they are elementary band representation, all these bands, they have to be connected. And this connectivity or lack of connectivity is what is, what is going to give me the information of the topological phase. Um, the mathematical tool to actually go from real space to reciprocal space with a Hamiltonian is called induction of a EDR, which is elementary man representation, and works in the following way. Within the same space group, for instance, the hexagonal space group, we can have different arrangements of the atoms. So, if we are dealing with a triangular lattice, we have one atom per unit cell. If we are dealing with a honeycomb lattice, we have two atoms per unit cell, and the arrangement is different. And if we are dealing with the Kagome lattice, we have three atoms per unit cell. <laughs> Therefore, we have different symmetries. Here, they have the atomic uh, position has the full symmetry of the space group, which is uh, C60. But here we have less symmetries and K even less. So the wave function is going to transform different depending on the arrangement of the atoms. Now, we have, we pick up one particular arrangement of the atoms, and then we have to put orbitals in those arrangements. So, if we add S or PC orbitals, again, the wave function is going to have a set, uh, some symmetries, but if we add PX and PY orbitals, they're going to have another one. For instance, <coughs> SP and PC are independent by themselves, because when we transform them in 2D, because they keep the the rotation symmetry, they don't transform into another orbital. But when we apply symmetries in the px and py, px and py transform between them. So we cannot, they are not independent. They form a representation by themselves. All right, so, but when we do this procedure that is an induction, depending on the uh, symmetries of uh, the lattice, we're going to have one set of bands on or another set of bands. So an elementary band representation is defined by the space group, the position of the atoms in the space group, and the orbitals. And when we fully transform into reciprocal space, at the high symmetry points, the wave function is going to have different, different properties depending on the orbitals. And these different properties have been classified. So the information I get by using an elementary band representation is the uh, symmetry properties of the little groups at the high symmetry points. And because it's this an elementary band representation, I know that all these bands, they need to be connected by definition. Um, so the maths, if uh, anyone is interested, I'm going to uh, mention the properties of the, of the site in real space are given by the site symmetry group, and the equivalent position are given what is called by the course of the composition of a space group. This is the definition of a, a space group, it's given by the properties of the course of the composition of the high symmetry group. And, well, the maths is that we, we actually, um, we actually uh, write down a matrix that has all the symmetries with the different elements of the, of the lattice and we fully transform to the reciprocal space. When we fully transform to the reciprocal space, we introduce the momentum k. We give the momentum k the values of the different high symmetry points. And we find the dimension of the, of the energy bands at the different high symmetry points, just to show you that the formalism is actually related to linear algebra. Anyway, so I have my arrangement of atoms with orbitals, and I induce an elementary representation, and now I'm here. I'm in reciprocal space 
with uh, these little groups here, but I know they have to be connected. So what, what is the relation of, of this that I'm talking about with topology? Well, the relation comes from a paper of uh, Zach and, and Michelle already back in 2000, where they claim that elementary energy bands in a crystal, they always need to be connected. And this is true. This is true as far as the bands are not topological, as far as the topological order is zero. Because, as I said before, this induction of band has been done in the atomic side. And therefore, the atomic limit is respected. And the topological bands, they do not respect the atomic limit, because otherwise there would be no charge flow on the edges. So, when we induce a band elementary band representation, for example, these bands are induced from these orbitals, we are uh, faced to simple scenarios. I induce it and I look at reciprocal space and my bands are connected. If the bands are connected, there is no topology. But if I induce my bands in real space and my bands are not connected, then my system display topological properties. And this has been done without performing any calculation of the very curvature of the very phase. So um, the topological uh, quantum chemistry statement uh, says the following that all set of bands induced from symmetric localized orbitals are topologically trivial by design and by contraposition. All set of bands not induced from symmetric localized orbitals are topologically non-trivial by design. So I just need to know whether when I have uh, elementary band representation in reciprocal space, whether the bands are connected or not. And if they are not, there has to be a charge flow somewhere. So, but there is another ingredient we need to take into account. So, I have the information of what happens at high symmetry points. How can I study the connectivity of the bands? Because, for example, in this case, which is uh, the induction of uh, PXPY orbital in a conical lattice, we have this famous Dirac point, right? But I have no information about the energies. So, the fact that I have a Dirac cone is related because I have decided to put this order of the, of the little groups in the K point. But if I invert this, this, this two points, if I invert K4 and K6, what happens is that I still fulfill the connection that I need between bands because to gamma K be connected, this line here has to be a subgroup of both point group of these two points. So this has to prevail. But if I invert these two points here, my in principle connected elementary band representation is not connected anymore. So here we have a trivial, a trivial band, and what we have here is a topological band. And how can I induce these two points? I can induce these two points by a strong spinotic coupling or the lattice parameters or, or any other, um, let's say, fluctuation of the, of the lattice. So, um, in order to look uh, for materials, topological materials, what I'm going to do is look at what happens <coughs> at the high symmetry points. And this notation that I write here, which uh, represents the, the, the symmetry of the wave function in reciprocal space, it's tabulated. I mean, I just need to calculate the characters of my wave function, and then I will know whether this is an elementary band representation or not, and if it's not connected, then it's topological. So in summary, the, the topological quantum chemistry methodology is we start with um, a space group with atoms in some position and orbitals. We induce an elementary band representation. We subduce it in the typical space by adding the particular values of the, of the momentum, and we see whether the bands are connected or not connected. If they are connected, if they are connected, then we have an elementary band representation. If they are disconnected, they do not fulfill atomic limit, and therefore we will have um, a topological insulator. <coughs> when they are connected, then we need to see whether we are in the half field regime or not. But uh, forget this uh, this semi-metal thing and just look at the fact that when our elementary bands are disconnected, we have a topological space. Um, it took us a lot of work to classify everything, 
These are all the elementary band representations that one can have in nature by considering all the possible arrangements of atoms, all the orbitals, and all the space rooms. And we find that we have 10,398 elementary band representations. And um, these are a bunch of pages that one can find in this article in the supplementary material. Um, but so, to understand a bit better uh, what we do and what does it mean. So, um, we have this uh, two dimensional crystal, and I'm going to actually check whether uh, it's topological or not. So, I can place atoms in different positions of my crystal. And uh, I can prove that for a spinner system with inversion, these are the most important positions of the crystal. So this is the origin of my crystal. I put an atom here, and I want to apply inversion, which is the only symmetry of my crystal. If I apply inversion, uh, since this is the origin, the atom, I mean, the side will not move. If I put it in 1B, and I apply inversion, I will move it to this side of the crystal, and in order to go back, the symmetry that would actually uh, leave my point invariant will be inversion plus translation. Same here, and same here. So I have all the symmetry operations that actually uh, have an action on my sides. Now, now that I have this classifier, I need to obtain the English representation in k-moment. So to do that, what I do is I build up what is called the character table. And the character table gives me the following information. I apply immersion to the s orbital in 1A, and nothing happens because the s orbital has all the rotation. When I apply inversion to the p orbital, the p orbital always swap. So the, the inversion is going to be, I mean, the, the inversion eigenvalue is going to be negative because it's, it changes. And then the other ones work in the same way, but I need to add the phase. The phase when I add translation. And the phase is going to be given by the, uh, the value of the k vector in the million sum. Right, so if it happens at x, it's going to be a to the i pi, so we're going to have a minus, and then pi pi, and so on. <coughs> so these are all my elementary band representations, because I only have one symmetry. And these are the characters of my elementary band representation. Now, imagine that I have a band that has these uh, inversion eigenvalues at the high symmetry points. So I have 3 plus and 1 minus. We know from long ago that whenever we have a known number of uh, inversion eigenvalues in our band, it has to be topological. But the new way of looking at it is that if I look at the induced elementary band representation, I always have an even number of uh, parity eigenvalues, either 2 plus or 2 minus, or 4 plus and 4 minus. So I cannot write despite the eigenvalues of the new band as a linear combination of any of these elementary band representations. Therefore, my system is going to be topological. So this is the method that we actually use to identify topological cases. All right, so this is all implemented in this website. For, for everything, we have the, all the space group, all the compatibility relations, so all the atomic limits. And uh, when, when actually you want to look for a particular space group, what are the important vital positions and what are the uh, orbitals that we need to induce and how are they supposed to be connected, here you have all the information. Uh, in particular, for example, if you want to look for a space group, in this case I think it's 199, these are the vital positions. This are the irreducible representation that are applied for orbitals. Not all the bands can be decomposed. We need to look at the ones that be decomposable. The information is here too. And we have the different branches that actually can uh, come out from this uh, decomposed band. And there is further information such as the high symmetry point we need to look at because in the, the region some will have many, many high symmetry points, but only a few of them are the important ones. Okay. So, this was the, the methodology, and now I want to explain how uh, do we look for materials. So um, in a real materials, we have uh, the Fermi level that always 
is the energy level uh, over the occupied states. And we need to we want to look at the topology just as the Fermi level because we want to be in the transport region. Right? So um, I have uh, three examples of different types of topology. And we have in this uh, easy system two uh, connected paths, two elementary one representation. One is pink and the other one is uh, green. Mm -hmm. And what I'm going to do is to find the spectra before the level, the Fermi energy, and I'm going to see whether I can write the spectra as a linear combination of the sum of the elementary one representation <coughs> below the Fermi And these coefficients <coughs> are the ones who are going to define the topology. So, in this case, this is a trivial insulator. Why? Because we have a full EDR below the Fermi level and a full EDR over the Fermi level. So if I want to define my vector, it's 1 times EDR1. So it's trivial. And this means that actually the, the charge of the electrons is localized in the atomic limit. The second case. So in the second case, the screen 1 is split for whatever reasons. And what happens is that part of it goes below the Fermi level and the other one over. So if I want to write my vector, I will have a full EBR, which is the pink one below, plus one half of the other one. Because one of the, um, the constants multiplying the EBR is fractional, this means that my, my system is topological. And actually what happens here is that somehow the charge from the corner moved closer <coughs> to the pink one. I mean, that's it's not the atomic limit. More complicated things can happen. Both EDRs split, and for whatever reasons, they get inverted. So in this case, both charge move away from the atomic limit, and my vector is going to be uh, one half times one plus one half times the other one. Or if it's too complicated, the only thing we can say is that it cannot be written as a linear combination of EDRs. So this is basically what we're going to do in a full experimental database. We're going to calculate the characters of the wave function below the Fermi level, see whether it forms an elementary one representation, and if not, see what type of elementary one, I mean, what type of topology class it will belong to. So, um, well, th this is the idea of the algorithm. We start with an uh, initial calculation, we calculate the characters, we input the all the materials in the uh, inorganic uh, crystal structure database from the University of Karlsruhe. We calculate the characters and then with a homemade program we calculate whether it's topological or not. And the uh, amazing uh, result of this is that actually at least at a theory level 27% of the materials are to have topological properties. So since we look at 26,000 materials, almost 27,000 materials, what we found is like 7,500 7, materials are typologic. Then of course, from theory to experiment, there is a long way and we need to consider some other interactions, but at least in the non-interacting picture, there are more topological materials than we expected. And what we see here is just, here, here we have some mana structures and this is the complicated calculation of the of the very curvature that I introduced before that actually we take some materials where in a space group that topological properties were not reported before and actually with the traditional method they are uh, topological. So um, the immediate consequence of this method is that um, we found that this move that is a crystal that was thought to be trivial for 12 years it happens that it's not trivial. And the reason why uh, people thought it was trivial is because when we lo they look at the surface, the surface states are gapped. So there is no charge flow at the surface. So by definition, this cannot be a topological because we know that because topological materials do not fulfill the atomic limit, the charge has to flow. And in this moment, it wasn't happening. But some uh, experimental uh, colleagues told us that they were measuring some uh, quantized uh, current at the edges of this mode, and since there was a new method, whether we could check if actually uh, this mode displayed topological properties or not. So, this is the one structure of this mode, it belongs to a crystal space, uh, hexagonal space group, and in red we have the balance bands and include the conduction bands. 
And if we look at the matter structure, here it seems that these two peaks could be connected. And maybe they were disconnected because this moon has is one of the most heavy elements and it has a very strong spin orbital. So we decided to calculate theoretically the the e reps at the high symmetry points and see whether they form an element diamond representation, which is here, as we can see, or well, I I I to see, but I can tell you that the occurrence are not random. I mean, we have a gamma is here, we need to have a gamma is here. And, I mean, we need to fulfill all the all the reps at high symmetry points to have a trivial trace. And then we did the calculation for the particular piece of bismuth, and what we see below the formula <coughs> is that actually this comes from a split DDR. So bismuth is actually topological. Um, there is a more uh, mathematical and uh, sophisticated, sophisticated way of understanding this. Of course, they're looking at the UDRs was the first step. Then the reason why bismuth is topological is because it actually has by itself uh, two uh, topological phases. So the C3 uh, rotation eigenvalue has two subspaces, one for um, eigenvalue minus one and the other one for these other two eigenvalues, and in each of the superspace we have a topological phase, and when we go to the surface, they get cut. But um, there must be a charge flow. You cannot have a topological phase that is strong and doesn't have a charge flow. So in the case of bismuth, where this charge goes is to the corners of a nanowire. So we need to decouple these two superspaces for the topological where the topo two topological pieces are happening, and when they decouple, we see that they're actually the, the two uh, spin channels that I introduced before are happening at the corners of the surface. And somehow, there is some experimental evidence that uh, this was the case. So in, uh, in the Yastani group in Princeton, they measured this uh, STM um, charge flow at the, at the corners of a hole of, uh, with hexagonal shape, which is actually what is predicted experimentally, I mean theoretically. And in Paris, with the Yepsel some interferometry, they, they measured the difference of the critical uh, current, and they also saw that some participation in the corners of a, of a nanowire. So these are called the high order TIs, and it can be generalized. So one of the TIs is uh, whenever we have uh, <coughs> x-state or surface state at uh, d minus 1 dimensions, and the higher order ones is when we can reduce dimensions. So for example, from 2D we can go to corners, and from 3D we can go, go to hinges or corners in a, in a polyhedron. So. And just um, to finish, uh, so all this material that has been uh, uh, calculated and diagnosed uh, topologically, they, they are uploaded in a database. This is called Topological Quantum Chemistry. And actually, uh, everyone can check here whether a material that they found is uh, topological or not by introducing the formula. For example, in this case, it is I. So here we have the symmetry indicators and the space group. If we click further, these are the lattice parameters. This is the crystal structure in real space. Um, this is the brilliant zone with the high symmetry points. This is the index in the in the in organic crystal structure database with all the symmetry indicators. We have also the band structure how it looks like and the density of the states, information about the gaps, and the e reps and what type of symmetries we need to break because it will have a semi metal. By <coughs> particular symmetries in this in a string, you can make a transition from a semi metal to a particular insulation. And uh, in case uh, the material is not in the database, there is also this uh, application in the we got a stylographic server where we upload uh, the program that we use to perform this work. So you uh, one just need to do a first principle calculation and then run this code 
and the output of this code has to be uploaded in the server and it gives you all the information that actually was in the data. So the symmetry indicators, the events, and what you need to do to actually induce the transition. Okay, so with this I finished with the talk. So I introduced the topological quantum chemistry, which is a new methodology to actually um, find the political phases in materials, and it's very efficient because it reduces the computing cost of uh, topological diagrams a lot. We implemented an algorithm that actually can, can run through a uh, database, and we, the results have been allowed in a topological materials database. So it proves that 27% of the materials are topological, at least in the non-interacting picture. It gives a description of how to build topological events, and uh, there is an online tool now to find the materials. And I would like to acknowledge all the people that are actually working in this, uh, in this project for the last three years. So it's invested by Andy Bird and Nick in Princeton. <coughs> Okay, with this postdoc, C. Jung Wan, Jennifer Cannon, and Barry Bradley, that now are away from Princeton. I work with Luis Elcor and Moisa Arroyo, that from the University of the Basque Country and the, and the developers of the Crystal Logographic uh, Developed Crystal Structure Database. From the University of Zurich, uh, with Pete Snaker and Frank Sindler, we work on the higher TIs, and Claudia Fels and Nicola Renault, they also contributed to the material sets. And I thank you all for your attention. So I, I, I want to congratulate you for your work on nature in 2017. It was a really beautiful work. So uh, most of the details, of course, as I'm a particle physicist, elude me. So I want to, to ask a question which maybe is totally trivial, I don't know. Uh, so if I understood correctly, you go from the symmetry, uh, the spatial symmetry of the crystal, you add the information about the orbitals, and then you construct these uh, elementary band representations. And how do you go from, uh, and then you, you do all this, uh, all this analysis of how the, if, if the connectivity is topologically non-trivial or not. Mm -hmm. uh, so how do you go from there to, to a, a real <coughs> composition? I mean, what, what, what allows you to go from, from that abstract symmetry ideas to some actual composition? Is, is it that some uh, atoms have some orbitals available and some others not? I mean, well, yeah, but it depends on the, of course, I mean, when, when you have a compound, uh, you only look at the balance electrons. Okay. That, and the balance electrons have some particular orbitals. I mean, you don't consider all the electrons of the atoms, but that's the last one that actually contributes to, to your system. But so so the, balance, the balance electrons are the ones that you put as the orbital in, in information to the... Okay. That's the... I mean... When you are at the transport regime, the, the balance bands, the, the important ones, are going to be uh, the, I mean, the ones that are away from the atom, right? That's the only electrons that can conduct the electricity. I mean, the, the Okay. Thank you, Maya. That was very impressive. Uh, one question. Uh, now we have discovered this. Uh, Topological insulating behavior in more compounds such as this uh, twisted graphene, right? Mm -hmm. So, is it possible all, also to predict these kind of behaviors in them? Yes, actually, um, well, it's So the, the thing of twisted graphene, first we need to make sure that we have bands because it's not clear to me that the correlations allow the, the material to have bands. If we have bands, the topology that they found in the twisted graphene is called fragile. And this fragile topology is actually a subtraction of VDRs. And you want to cancel your another slide.
see you later. But yeah, it's called um, <coughs> Frontend Topology. And actually, what it happens in this tutorial you're talking is that you have a subtraction of the VR. So the bands that actually can be topology to the graphene is when you have an EVR and you subtract another one. And this is can only be predicted with this method because otherwise uh, it was not clear cool why this would be, I mean, this topology that phase would exist. And it's quite in a sense that because you have these subtractions, whenever you add the bands that they're missing, you trivialize it, which is something that was not believed to happen in, um, in topology that phases. So that's the step by the that was pretty good. Yes. What kind of application do you expect with this kind of materials? <coughs> of the political materials? Yes. The, well, they are suitable for actually um, spintronics because you have this effective spin transfer. You can also use it as a transistor because you have this small gap that actually um, you have this small gap in the box and with the surface state on the surface and when you have a universal number you can manipulate it with a gate with an electric field. So it can also be used as transistors. And for optical, they also have a very particular response when you apply light with some particular symmetries when the crystal has no, for example, mirror or inversion, the response of the, of the material is quantized in terms of like the circular to the galvanic effect. So that can be, have the applications that one can find in quantum optics, which I think there are a bunch of them. And if low, I mean, they, they are low dissipation technology because since uh, all these channels, if we can have a good material with a nice gap, so we have these um, channels in the middle of the gap, if the band structure is clean, there is no back scattering, so there is no dissipation, so they are very suitable for whatever electronic application because they don't, they cannot like uh, heat up the, the device, device. But I think with these properties, they must have more applications. This is a curiosity. Uh, a time reversal depends on the number of fermions in your system because t squared is equal to the identity or minus the identity. In the case of the identity, it can be an observable. In the other case, it's not. Is it reflected in your topology somehow? Yes, of course. If, uh, yes, if uh, it squares to 1, I mean that the spinless electrons, uh, you cannot have uh, these topologies uh, that I introduced at the beginning. So you need, you need to be an anti-unitary operator. This is a problem of photonic crystals. Actually. It's t, t square. The t square equals the, the identity or minus the identity. It is squares to minus. Well, when, when you have a when you have a spin full electrons, it is squares to minus, minus one minus the identity. Yes. So you need that to actually have these. Um, you need that to get this number. And you need this number to actually uh, have uh, these two channels that are going In order to, co to connect the balance band with conduction band and have in the, be in the middle, you need the ten universal symmetry to square to minus the identity. Or in 3D, you can have other symmetries that can substitute the, the ten universal symmetry. But in 2D, for example, it's not possible. So we really need to, to have a spoon for the so, question. Okay. <coughs> uh, the method that you show uh, it seems to apply uh, depending on the study properties of a given crystal made of uh, some specific uh, set of atoms uh, with a given set of electrical sensors. How does that change if you, for example, modify external condition like heating the material or changing the pressure in which it is? Uh, can you change the topological phase or not? I mean, it's, it's related to symmetry, so it depends what symmetries you break or you induce. If you induce new symmetries, of course you change the topology. If you break some symmetries, you also change the topology. 
define these topologies ingredients as I said in the space group, the particular positions that where you put your atoms and the orbitals. So any external change like pressure can induce a little transition. So the temperature. So there are materials that in different temperatures they have different crystal structures. So the last question. Okay.